As far as I know, a recruiter spends no more than seven seconds reading a CV. A recruiter spends no more than seven seconds reading a CV. No more than seven seconds reading a CV. Hello everyone, I am Bartolo for Gallery Teachers and we are producing a series of videos about TEFL, that is teaching English as a foreign language. Today we talk about CVs. Is it a good idea to spam your CV to as many companies as possible or maybe there are better strategies? Today we have two very special guests. One is Megan Wummer, course director and center manager of uh, TEFL in Italy and TEFL in Spain. She works in uh, close contact with uh, uh, recruiters and uh, she gives professional advice. And then we have Roberta Belliomini, a language confidence consultant and owner of Yellow. She will give us uh, advice from the perspective of uh, the owner of the company. And Megan, Good to see you again. What I like about your company is that you have um, a business approach to the teaching. And I think this is very important and something that we are usually missing. We talk about uh, grammar, about lexis, about how to teach English, but then you get your qualification and what do you do? I'm not a professional recruiter, but sometimes I recruit people. And uh, as soon as I put on a job advert, 200 people apply. For professional recruiters, they will have thousands of people applying for the same job, especially in uh, large towns. So is it still worth it to put all of your energies in uh, writing a CV and then applying with uh, your CV? Or what is the best strategy to find the job? You know, the CV is not going to be replaced. Um, it's a great way to uh, summarize all of your skills that you have, you know, keeping it short. So two pages max for a CV um, you know, don't list all of your experience, list the one that's applicable for the job that you're applying for. Um, I also see a lot for CVs, um, as in the past, I, I was in charge of, of recruiting as well, that students are listing or candidates are listing more responsibilities instead of skills. Um, so I think it's important to really be able to articulate and identify the skills that you possess, that you have. So instead of saying I'm able to teach or I taught in the past a B2 group, um, say that you were able to prepare um, your B2 group for an official examination and you taught hybrid lessons teaching face-to-face -face and online using the Zoom platform. So these specifications are going to make an employer um, you know, choose that CV right at the beginning uh, instead of having to sift through those thousands of CVs. So I think that's important to really um, sit down and think about the skills you have more than the responsibilities or the actions that you carried out at your jobs in the past. Um, so, so for me, that, that's the most important part. Aside from that, I would really encourage everyone to get a professional profile. I know one in three recruiters um, checks out a professional profile on social media like LinkedIn or, or maybe an Instagram if you're running your own business or Facebook. Um, so I would encourage everyone to create their own professional profile. Um, and even if they are a non-native speaker of English, um, why not uh, create a professional profile where you can upload a video of yourself teaching um, so they can see your expertise, so they can see your proficiency in English. Um, I think those, for me, really make a candidate stand out uh, when they're looking for a job. What do you think about uh, the gaps in uh, your CV? I worked on, in London a lot and uh, you are always looking for a new job and it's not always the job that you want. It happened to me sometimes that I was working in uh, one of the most important TV companies and my next job was working with an agency as a waiter. I shifted from being a manager to being just somebody in the agency. And then the next job was a, a teacher or something that I liked. So in between, I had to put these experiences because otherwise my CV would be incomplete or it would be better to hide the experiences that are not relevant. Again, I would keep maybe your most uh, relevant experiences, but I think also being a waiter, let's look at again the skills that you gained there. So um, you were in another country, maybe speaking to um, clients and customers in another language. Um, you had to be reactive and think on your feet. Um, you had to have people skills. Um, 
So I think all of these could be applicable for having a job uh, as a teacher or getting into academic management. Um, so I think uh, these days too, we're a lot more flexible. We understand that with the current situation um, that sometimes jobs are part-time or they last shorter than they did in the past. Um, but I think as long as we can pick out again, the skills that are applicable to the job that we want, um, yeah, there's no need to hide them. Um, I, they, they build us up to what we're in, what, who we become today. So um, yeah, it's just a question of highlighting and bringing to the forefront um, the most important aspects of that job that we could apply in a future context. If you had to start a game with uh, your experience and with uh, your knowledge of uh, the industry, what would you do now in order to start your career? Where do you think is worth to invest your time and maybe also money and what's better to uh, leave aside because uh, it's too difficult, too competition or there's no future, especially on things to avoid? Things to avoid, yeah, good one. Um, so I think I would move my search and my energies onto the online um, community. So when I started out, there was a lot more word of mouth um, a lot more, you know, traveling around the city on my bicycle, uh, on the buses to find all of these jobs and hand in all my CVs um, face to face. But I think a lot of that can be done online now. Um, so I would create um, an advertisement. I would be proactive about it, create a, a web page. Uh, if I'm starting my own business, create a professional profile. Um, so to be proactive in my job search. Um, I think these are great ways not only to find um, private students, but for companies maybe to reach out to you. Um, I would also spend my money maybe in upskilling in a particular niche market that I'm interested in. So if my dream job is working in the business English sector or maybe with young learners, I would invest maybe some money and time in taking a course in that area and adding that to my CV so that um, you know, while I'm waiting for these jobs to appear, I can make sure I'm prepared for them. Um, and I can make sure that that sets me apart a little bit from all of the other competition uh, that's out there. So I think those are some great ways to, to focus our time. So instead of having um, a profile that says, I'll teach any class, any level, any, um, you know, get specific. What can you offer? Do you have a background in coaching or in, um, in business that's really going to help you to reach out to a particular profile? Um, and I think that could be really, really attractive to really kind of narrowing down who you want to work with in a way. Thank you. I think it's uh, a brilliant advice. Um, also, I noticed that um, our profession changed in a way that before we were looking just for a job in a school, while now we have to be more entrepreneurial. Roberta, do you work with uh, native English speakers or just foreigners? Yes, I have just one and three uh, are not uh, native speakers that teach English. If I, if I can tell about differences, you know, well, we learn English, okay, you and me were not native, I teach English, so I know the difficulties, I know the hardships of learning the language. We know that what you want is to communicate. In Italian, um, you, what you read is what you say. In English, it's a completely different thing. It's not like this. So it's difficult. When you leave the situation as a non-native speaker and you become a teacher, you know what the person is because you have been in her or his shoes. Usually people want to work with uh, native speakers. They don't realize that uh, understanding a native speaker is more complicated, especially when you start. I'm uh, very interested in um, the fact that you are not hiring just uh, native speakers. A very common question among people that want to study to become English teachers is, is it worth it to invest in education to become an English teacher if you are not native speaker? And I think this brings sadness. Because mm -hmm. uh, you are passionate about something, but you know that that is not for you. The, the gate is closed for you. And I would like your help to change this mentality. Another great question, by the way. Look, um, I have faced this situation so many times. And I say, I think that this is one of the reasons why I created my own startup. Because when I moved uh, to Italy, I was trying to find jobs and everybody, especially in Florence, and I mean, people, and I know maybe not only in Florence, maybe parents, they think that mother tongue teachers will teach better, right? 
So I remember that I was like, oh my God, I sent my CVs. Okay, I, I, I was going in person, like delivering my, like, look, I'm a stick English, right? It's good, it's not bad. And they were saying, yeah, you know. So at a certain point, I got really upset. So I had two options. Either I find a job as a waitress, you know, because I have to survive, or I create my own business. Since I have a marketing background, I said, okay, I can do it. And then, um, I, and then I realized that a lot of people enjoyed not the classes or me as a teacher, not because I was or wasn't a mother tongue teacher. You should spend money on this thing and in other certificates because you learn a lot. So teaching more than anything is about the method and it's about your passion, okay? When you are passionate about doing something, believe me, you are going to have work for the rest of your life. I am uh, reading a book about TEFL that has been published in uh, 2017. And uh, they say in the first page, they say that uh, the basic requirements are, one, you have to be a native speaker. And this was published in uh, 2017. I'm wondering if uh, this is still a good book to read or maybe... Three years ago, four yes. years ago. Four years ago. I think that non-native speakers have huge opportunities to find jobs, especially now, because believe me, the good news about this new um, reality is that I have been working a lot. My colleagues have been working a lot because people are interested in learning since they have more time at home. Let's send a letter to this author. He has to revise it. You're also the owner of your school. So can you give us advice on uh, how to apply for jobs? Is it worth it to invest uh, your time in uh, writing a CV and then applying to as many places as possible? Or what is a good strategy to uh, show your skills and uh, getting your attention as uh, the school owner? I'm not saying that you have to stop sending CVs. Not at all. Okay. But a good strategy is not only for teaching, but for everything is networking. I tell from my experience, I, all the teachers that were here, they are people that were recommended by someone. And why? Because we have a very, we are, we're not a big school, okay? We are like quite small school, but we, we work a lot based on our trust. I usually hire people if I have good recommendations, so instead of only sending a CV, try to look at letters of reference for something. Or can you, when you send a CV, you can just write something in the email that call the attention. Because as far as I know, a recruiter spends no more than seven seconds reading a CV. Uh, and try to put the keywords in bold so when they, he or she reads it, that's what happens to me. Ah, okay, so this person has some experience in, I don't know, Brazil? Ah, I have a lot of Brazilian students that want to learn English. That's a good person, okay? So this is number one. And number two, networking people, you know? Go on LinkedIn, you know, just go on the workshops of gallery teachers. You know, that's how we met each other. And believe me, one door takes you to another one. So I think that's my, don't stop sending CVs, but networking is very, very important. Thank you. Uh, also, thank you for the advertising. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it, is it okay? <laughs> but yes. Yeah, Go and attend our webinars. They are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's right. Actually, it's the truth. <laughs> thank you. We, we appreciate that. Can you tell us uh, how your way of working changed since uh, the coronavirus? The first phase was, wow, the outbreak. Okay, we have this problem, what do we do? You know, we managed to learn how to use Zoom or Skype. It was very stressful at the beginning. We had to learn a new reality. It was stressful not for us, only for us, for the kids, for the adolescents, for the adults, for the parents of the kids. And it's not finished. Uh, but the good news is that now we know how to deal with it before we, we weren't sure about it. 
So yes, now we live in this hybrid, I like to call it like a hybrid environment. I think there is no way back. People now are looking for courses online because they realize that this is the new reality. That's all for today. I am Balto Lansaldi for Gallery Teachers and our very special guests for today were Roberta Belliomini of Yellow and uh, Megan Woomer of uh, Tefal in Italy and Tefal in Spain. If you want to get in touch with them, I will leave a link in the description. If you think you have something important to say to the TEFL community, uh, you want to write an article for our blog or you want to get interviewed on uh, this channel, please write it to us at editorial at galleryteachers.com and we will get back to you. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel and help us grow as a community. That's all. Thank you for watching us and until the next time, happy teaching and happy learning.